In a recent interview, Senator Elizabeth Warren revealed that she will run for re-election in 2024, and she also touched on her new book and briefly discussed her relationship with Senator Bernie Sanders. When asked why she waited to endorse a candidate after she dropped out of the 2020 race, Warren claimed, quoted, she wanted to wait until there was just one person in the race that she could get behind 100%. Co-host of the Bad Faith Podcast, Brianna Joy Gray, she joins us now to weigh in on Warren's interview and more. There's a lot, there's a lot going on uh, there, Brianna. I know it's been a while, but I mean, even now in this day, um, to be singing this tune, it just is pretty remarkable uh, in order to stick with that story. Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand it, the point of an endorsement is to help undecided voters choose between more than one remaining candidate. And the idea of waiting until the pool whittles down to no choice remains kind of defies the purpose of an endorsement. And at that time, it was a particularly remarkable um, uh, choice to stay out of the endorsement process since so much of the race was defined by the fact that there were these progressive candidates and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. And so much of the pitch for Elizabeth Warren at the time was, well, she believes everything Bernie believes, but she has a plan for it. And you get the added benefit of having a level of gender diversity that we've never had in the White House. And so if there, that identity of interest is true, if that simpatico on these big substantive issues that we were all supposed to be very committed to was valid, then the idea that you wouldn't endorse the sole remaining person in the race that supported health care as a human right, that supported a wealth tax, that supported a free child care plan and on and on and on down the line um, was really frustrating. Brianna, you were obviously high level um, in the Bernie Sanders campaign. Just take us back to that time. Were the, was there surprise that Warren decided not to endorse? Was there frustration or was there sort of an expectation because she kind of did the same thing back in 2016 um, that she would, you know, punt again and not really weigh in on behalf of a progressive ideology? Yeah, I won't pretend to have been privy to what I'm sure were more intimate conversations between the Bernie camp and uh, the Warren camp. But amongst staffers, I think there was a degree of surprise. And I think among the left community more broadly, there was a degree of surprise because remember, not everyone had decided firmly on Bernie Sanders. And there was a lot of very complimentary pieces written um, coming out of uh, lefty magazines like Jacobin and a lot of people on the broader left, DSA members, who were genuinely divided as to who to support. So to have put your faith and confidence in someone because you genuinely thought they were going to make the best decisions for a progressive community, it, it really manifested as a letdown for folks who didn't already see her as someone who um, had would, would stab them in the back, as it were. And mm -hmm. the idea that there is a, an undeserved level of frustration or ire against her, uh, something that she talked about in the interview with Rachel Maddow that she did as she ended her campaign and talking about the frustration of snake emojis, et cetera. I mean, we can have a conversation about how people should best express that frustration, but what shouldn't get lost is that I think the frustration itself was very well founded and rooted in her actions as an individual and as a human being, and not simply because, for example, she's a woman. And so, Brianna, I think the broader question here, which is that it was done with a political calculation that she would get rewarded by the Biden team, Secretary of Treasury, something like that. And that didn't end up happening. And it's not like she's particularly influential in the legislative process. So what would you say just as a warning to people who are looking at it from that perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think we all remember that there was a time, uh, there was a story that Bernie Sanders was investigating whether yeah. Elizabeth Warren could serve as vice president and think secret secretary of, tre of treasury at the same time. Um, he was someone who encouraged Elizabeth Warren to run back in 2016 uh, against Hillary Clinton and hoped that she would have been our president uh, for the last uh, four years and, and, and now. So uh, it, it is, it is, I think, never a good idea to make decisions solely based on a long-term political calculus because we're increasingly moving into a political space where voters are no longer accepting that politicians are going to politician or accepting that you can just be a player in the game as Elizabeth Warren once described herself. And I think we're seeing that right now with Andrew Yang, who has really stepped in it insofar as he gave what historically has been a pretty pat response to violence against Palestinians um, by uh, Israelis. and. 
uh, other people in the race has given have given a similar response and they haven't gotten the same blowback because he's holding himself out and he has held himself out as someone who can absorb some of the uh, left energy and left support that was remaining after Bernie the Bernie Sanders race. Hmm. And no longer are voters comfortable with the expectation that people are just going to toe the political line. They think they have to toe to get certain endorsements or what have you. Folks want to know that you're really going to stick to your morals and values. And now finally, it's starting to be the case that there's a political cost for presenting yourself in purely political kind of craven terms. That's That's actually a very interesting parallel because it's not just, I I would actually take it out of a left-right spectrum and say he really held himself out as an authentic voice, right? And I think that's Mm. been a big part of his appeal is even when you feel like, hey, I don't exactly agree with that, but I think he's coming at this from like a good a good place, really believes what he's saying. On this, it just really feels like he's giving what he thinks, what his consultants told him was the political answer. Yeah. And he issued a sort of apology today after talking to some staffers and some close yeah. supporters who are very upset by his um, you know, wildly unnuanced take on the issue. And I do think that that is an interesting parallel with Warren, because when you think back about her early career, like what got her into politics, there she was challenging Hillary Clinton, challenging Joe Biden, holding them to the standards of the principles that they are supposed to support in a way that was very, you know, very challenging and very brave and very honest. And even in her early political career, you know, giving speeches that really resonated because they had that same quality. And then over the course of the time that she's in D.C., you start to see more of this political calculation emerge and more of this I'm just a player in the game calculation emerge. You see it in 2016 and the way she played that endorsement process. You see it here. You see it even the way that she shaped her campaign. And finally, you know, full's coming full circle. Not only does she not endorse Bernie, she spends the last days of her campaign attacking him as a sexist and never challenges Joe Biden on the very bankruptcy issues that were so core to her and brought her ultimately into politics. What does that trajectory say about what D.C. does to people who come in with genuine principles, values and ideology? Look, I I don't know if it was D.C. or not. I mean, Elizabeth Warren is someone who was uh, a registered Republican up until her her mid 40s. She's someone who was embroiled in scandal at the start of her campaign um, as she tried to uh, correct the record, as it were, on her longstanding claims of uh, having Native American heritage and whether or not she misrepresented herself throughout her professional career. You know, Harvard, uh, the Harvard Crimson held her out as Native American and applauded the university for having their first non-white female hire at the time when the university was embroiled in a lot of conflict about the fact that it had very little um, staff of color. Uh, She is someone whose campaign, I I would argue, went off the rails at the time at which she was unable to give a clear answer on how she was going to fund Medicare for all. And the distinction between her kind of equivocations and Bernie Sanders' um, willingness to say the perhaps unpopular thing that, yes, you know, taxes will go up, but less than the amount you're paying in premiums, co-pays and deductibles was a real lightning rod for people who like the authenticity to your point. So whether or not it's a, a, a an issue of DC corrupting her, I think that she has someone who, ha- who hasn't been willing to kind of do the soul searching and decide what her ideological moorings are sufficient to get a large following of people to really rally to her cause. We saw that in the campaign. We saw that in the fact that she came third in her own state. And we saw that in her failure to have, I think, substantive influence now that the campaign is over. And as someone who supports a lot of the policies that she has supported over the years, it's frustrating that she has, I think, diminished her ability to have influence and sway because of those um, ideological and uh, missteps and missteps of principle. Yeah. I think that is all well said. Brianna, always great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Gideon Lewis-Krauss is going to discuss how the Pentagon started taking UFOs seriously. That's when Rising continues.